Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Three, Chapter Four Calm in Storm. Dr. Manette did not return until the morning of the fourth day of his absence. So much of what had happened in that dreadful time as could be kept from the knowledge of Lucy was so well concealed from her that not until long afterwards, when France and she were far apart, did she know that eleven hundred defenceless prisoners of both sexes and all ages had been killed by the populace, that four days and nights had been darkened by this deed of horror, and that the air around her had been tainted by the slain. She only knew that there had been an attack upon the prison, that all political prisoners had been in danger, and that some had been dragged out by the crowd and murdered. To Mr. Lorry, the doctor communicated, under an injunction of secrecy on which he had no need to dwell, that the crowd had taken him through a scene of carnage to the prison of La Force, that in the prison he had found a self-appointed tribunal sitting, before which the prisoners were brought singly, and by which they were rapidly ordered to be put forth to be massacred, or to be released, or, in a few cases, to be sent back to their cells that, presented by his conductors to this tribunal, he had announced himself by name and profession as having been for eighteen years a secret and unaccused prisoner in the Bastille, that one of the bodies so sitting in judgment had risen and identified him, and that this man was Defarge, that hereupon he had ascertained, through the registers on the table, that his son-in-law was among the living prisoners, and had pleaded hard to the tribunal, of whom some members were asleep and some awake, some dirty with murder and some clean, some sober and some not, for his life and liberty, that in the first frantic greetings lavished on himself as a notable sufferer under the overthrown system, it had been accorded to him to have Charles Darnay brought before the lawless court and examined, that he seemed on the point of being at once released— when the tide in his favour met with some unexplained check, not intelligible to the doctor, which led to a few words of secret conference, that the man sitting as president had then informed Dr. Manette that the prisoner must remain in custody, but should, for his sake, be held inviolate in safe custody, that immediately, on a signal, the prisoner was removed to the interior of the prison again, but that he, the doctor, had then so strongly pleaded for permission to remain and assure himself that his son-in-law was, through no malice or mischance, delivered to the concourse, whose murderous yells outside the gate had often drowned the proceedings, that he had obtained the permission, and had remained in that hall of blood until the danger was over. The sights he had seen there— with brief snatches of food and sleep by intervals, shall remain untold. The mad joy over the prisoners who were saved has astounded him scarcely less than the mad ferocity against those who were cut to pieces. One prisoner there was, he said, who had been discharged into the street free, but at whom a mistaken savage had thrust a pike as he passed out being besought to go to him and dress the wound, the doctor had passed out at the same gate, and had found him in the arms of a company of Samaritans who were seated on the bodies of their victims. With an inconsistency as monstrous as anything in this awful nightmare, they had helped the healer, and tended the wounded man with the gentlest solicitude, had made a litter for him, and escorted him carefully from the spot had then caught up their weapons, and plunged anew into a butchery so dreadful that the doctor had covered his eyes with his hands, and swooned away in the midst of it. As Mr. Lorry received these confidences, and as he watched the face of his friend, now sixty-two years of age, a misgiving arose within him that such dread experiences would revive the old danger— but he had never seen his friend in his present aspect. He had never at all known him in his present character. For the first time the doctor felt, now, 
that his suffering was strength and power. For the first time he felt that in that sharp fire he had slowly forged the iron which could break the prison door of his daughter's husband and deliver him. It all tended to a good end, my friend. It was not mere waste and ruin. As my beloved child was helpful in restoring me to myself, I will be helpful now in restoring the dearest part of herself to her. By the aid of heaven, I will do it. Thus Dr. Manette. And when Jarvis Lorry saw the kindled eyes, the resolute face, the calm, strong look and bearing of a man whose life always seemed to him to have been stopped like a clock for so many years, and then set going again with an energy which had lain dormant during the cessation of its usefulness, he believed. Greater things than the doctor had at that time to contend with would have yielded before his persevering purpose. While he kept himself in his place as a physician, whose business was with all degrees of mankind, bond and free, rich and poor, bad and good, he used his personal influence so wisely that he was soon the inspecting physician of three prisons, and among them of La Force. He could now assure Lucy that her husband was no longer confined alone, but was mixed with the general body of prisoners. He saw her husband weakly, and brought sweet messages to her, straight from his lips. Sometimes her husband himself sent a letter to her, though never by the doctor's hand. But she was not permitted to write to him, for among the many wild suspicions of plots in the prisons, the wildest of all pointed at emigrants who were known to have made friends or permanent connections abroad. This new life of the doctor's was an anxious life, no doubt. Still, the sagacious Mr. Lorry saw that there was a new sustaining pride in it. Nothing unbecoming tinged the pride. It was a natural and worthy one. But he observed it as a curiosity. The doctor knew that up to that time his imprisonment had been associated in the minds of his daughter and his friend with his personal affliction, deprivation, and weakness. Now that this was changed, and he knew himself to be invested through that old trial with forces to which they both looked for Charles's ultimate safety and deliverance, he became so far exalted by the change that he took the lead and direction, and required them as the weak to trust to him as the strong. The preceding relative positions of himself and Lucy were reversed, yet only as the liveliest gratitude and affection could reverse them, for he could have no pride but in rendering some service to her who had rendered so much to him. "'All curious to see,' thought Mr. Lorry, in his amiably shrewd way, "'but all natural and right. So take the lead, my dear friend, and keep it. It couldn't be in better hands.' But, though the doctor tried hard, and never ceased trying, to get Charles Darnay set at liberty, or at least to get him brought to trial, the public current of the time set too strong and fast for him. The new era began. The king was tried, doomed, and beheaded. The republic of liberty, equality, fraternity, or death, declared for victory or death against the world in arms. The black flag waved night and day from the great towers of Notre Dame. Three hundred thousand men, summoned to rise against the tyrants of the earth, rose from all the varying soils of France, as if the dragon's teeth had been sown broadcast, and had yielded fruit equally on hill and plain, on rock, in gravel and alluvial mud, under the bright sky of the south, and under the clouds of the north in fell and forest, in the vineyards, and the olive-grounds, and among the cropped grass and the stubble of the court, along the fruitful banks of the broad rivers, and in the sand of the seashore. What private solicitude could rear itself against the deluge of year one of liberty, the deluge rising from below, not falling from above, and with the windows of heaven shut, not opened? There was no pause, no pity, no peace, no interval of relenting rest, no measurement of time. 
though days and nights circled as regularly as when time was young, and the evening and morning were the first day. Other count of time there was none. Hold of it was lost in the raging fever of a nation, as it is in the fever of one patient. Now, breaking the unnatural silence of a whole city, the executioner showed the people the head of the king. And now, it seemed, almost in the same breath, the head of his fair wife, which had had eight weary months of imprisoned widowhood and misery to turn it grey. And yet, observing the strange law of contradiction which obtains in all such cases, the time was long while it flamed by so fast. A revolutionary tribunal in the capital, and forty or fifty thousand revolutionary committees all over the land, a law of the suspected, which struck away all security for liberty or life, and delivered over any good and innocent person to any bad and guilty one. Prisons, gorged with people who had committed no offence, and could obtain no hearing. These things became the established order and nature of appointed things, and seemed to be ancient usage before they were many weeks old. Above all, one hideous figure grew as familiar as if it had been before the general gaze from the foundations of the world, the figure of the sharp female called La Guillotine. It was the popular theme for jests. It was the best cure for headache. It infallibly prevented the hair from turning grey. It imparted a peculiar delicacy to the complexion. It was the national razor which shaved close. Who kissed La Guillotine, looked through the little window, and sneezed into the sack. It was the sign of the regeneration of the human race. It superseded the cross. Models of it were worn on breasts from which the cross was discarded, and it was bowed down to, and believed in, where the cross was denied. It sheared off heads so many, that it and the ground it most polluted were a rotten red. It was taken to pieces, like a toy puzzle for a young devil, and was put together again when the occasion wanted it. It hushed the eloquent, struck down the powerful, abolished the beautiful and good. Twenty-two friends of high public mark, twenty-one living and one dead. It had lopped the heads off in one morning, in as many minutes. The name of the strong man of old scripture had descended to the chief functionary who worked it, but so armed he was stronger than his namesake, and blinder, and tore away the gates of God's own temple every day. Among these terrors, and the brood belonging to them, the doctor walked with a steady head, confident in his power, cautiously persistent in his end, never doubting that he would save Lucy's husband at last. Yet the current of the time swept by, so strong and deep, and carried the time away so fiercely, that Charles had lain in prison one year and three months, when the doctor was thus steady and confident. So much more wicked and distracted had the revolution grown in that December month that the rivers of the south were encumbered with the bodies of the violently drowned by night, and prisoners were shot in lines and squares under the southern wintry sun. Still the doctor walked among the terrors with a steady head, no man better known than he in Paris at that day, no man in a stranger situation. Silent, humane, indispensable in hospital and prison, using his art equally among assassins and victims. He was a man apart. In the exercise of his skill, the appearance and the story of the Bastille captive removed him from all other men. He was not suspected, or brought in question, any more than if he had indeed been recalled to life some eighteen years before, or were a spirit moving among mortals. End of Book Three, Chapter Four. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Three, Chapter Five The Wood Sawyer. 
One year and three months. During all that time, Lucy was never sure from hour to hour but that the guillotine would strike off her husband's head next day. Every day, through stony streets, the tumbrils now jolted heavily, filled with condemned. Lovely girls, bright women, brown-haired, black-haired and grey, youths, stalwart men and old, gentle-born and peasant-born, all red wine for la guillotine, all daily brought into light from the dark cellars of the loathsome prisons, and carried to her through the streets to slake her devouring thirst. Liberty, equality, fraternity, or death. The last much the easiest to bestow, O Guillotine. If the suddenness of her calamity, and the whirling wheels of the time, had stunned the doctor's daughter into awaiting the result in idle despair, it would but have been with her as it was with many. But from the hour when she had taken the white head to her fresh young bosom in the garret of St. Antoine, she had been true to her duties. She was truest to them in the season of trial, as all the quietly loyal and good will always be. As soon as they were established in their new residence, and her father had entered on the routine of his avocations, she arranged the little household as exactly as if her husband had been there. Everything had its appointed place and its appointed time. Little Lucy she taught, as regularly as if they had all been united in their English home. The slight devices with which she cheated herself into the show of a belief that they would soon be reunited, the little preparations for his speedy return, the setting aside of his chair and of his books, these and the solemn prayer at night for one dear prisoner especially, among the many unhappy souls in prison and the shadow of death, were almost the only outspoken reliefs of her heavy mind. She did not greatly alter in appearance. The plain dark dresses, akin to mourning dresses, which she and her child wore, were as neat and as well attended to as the brighter clothes of happy days. She lost her colour, and the old and intent expression was a constant, not an occasional, thing. Otherwise she remained very pretty and comely. Sometimes at night, on kissing her father, she would burst into the grief she had repressed all day, and would say that her sole reliance under heaven was on him. He always resolutely answered, "'Nothing can happen to him without my knowledge, "'and I know that I can save him, Lucy.' "'They had not made the round of their changed life many weeks, "'when her father said to her, on coming home one evening, "'My dear, there is an upper window in the prison, "'to which Charles can sometimes gain access at three in the afternoon.' When he can get to it, which depends on many uncertainties and incidents, he might see you in the street, he thinks, if you stood in a certain place that I can show you. But you will not be able to see him, my poor child, and even if you could, it would be unsafe for you to make a sign of recognition. Oh, show me the place, my father, and I will go there every day. From that time, in all weathers, she waited there two hours. As the clock struck two, she was there, and at four she turned resignedly away. When it was not too wet or inclement for her child to be with her, they went together. At other times she was alone, but she never missed a single day. It was the dark and dirty corner of a small winding street. The hovel of a cutter of wood into lengths for burning was the only house at that end, all else was wall. On the third day of her being there, he noticed her. "'Good day, citizeness. "'Good day, citizen.' This mode of address was now prescribed by decree. It had been established voluntarily some time ago among the more thorough patriots, but was now law for everybody. "'Walking here again, citizeness.' 
"'You see me, citizen?' The wood sawyer, who was a little man with the redundancy of gesture, he had once been a mender of roads, cast a glance at the prison, pointed at the prison, and putting his ten fingers before his face to represent bars, peeped through them jocosely. "'Wood is not my business,' said he, and went on sawing his wood. Next day he was looking out for her, and accosted her the moment she appeared. "'What? Walking here again, citizeness?' "'Yes, citizen.' "'Oh, a child, too? "'Your mother, is it not, my little citizeness?' "'Do I say yes, mamma? whispered little Lucy, drawing close to her. "'Yes, dearest.' "'Yes, citizen.' "'Ah, oh, but it's not my business. My work is my business. See my saw. I call it my little guillotine. La, 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 and off his head comes. The billet fell as he spoke, and he threw it into a basket. I call myself the Samson of the firewood guillotine. See here again. Loo, 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 and off her head comes. Now, child, tickle, tickle, pickle, pickle, and off each head comes, all the family. Lucy shuddered, as he threw two more billets into his basket. But it was impossible to be there while the wood sawyer was at work, and not be in his sight. Thenceforth, to secure his good will, she always spoke to him first, and often gave him drink money, which he readily received. He was an inquisitive fellow, and sometimes, when she had quite forgotten him in gazing at the prison roof and grates, and in lifting her heart up to her husband, she would come to herself to find him looking at her, with his knee on his bench, and his saw stopped in its work. "'But it's not my business,' he would generally say on those times, and would briskly fall to his sawing again. In all weathers, in the snow and frost of winter, in the bitter winds of spring, in the hot sunshine of summer, in the rains of autumn, and again in the snow and frost of winter, Lucy passed two hours of every day at this place, and every day on leaving it she kissed the prison wall. Her husband saw her, so she learnt from her father. It might be once in five or six times, it might be twice or thrice running. It might be not for a week or a fortnight together. It was enough that he could and did see her when the chances served, and on that possibility she would have waited out the day seven days a week. These occupations brought her round to the December month, wherein her father walked among the terrors with a steady head. On a lightly snowing afternoon she arrived at the usual corner. It was a day of some wild rejoicing and a festival. She had seen the houses as she came along, decorated with little pikes and with little red caps stuck upon them, also with tricoloured ribbons, also with the standard inscription. Tricoloured letters were the favourite. Republic one and indivisible. Liberty, equality, fraternity or death. The miserable shop of the wood-sawyer was so small that its whole surface furnished very indifferent space for this legend. He had got somebody to scrawl it up for him, however, who had squeezed death in with most inappropriate difficulty. On his housetop he displayed pike and cap, as a good citizen must, and in a window he had stationed his saw, inscribed as his little Sainte Guillotine for the great sharp female was by that time popularly canonised. His shop was shut, and he was not there, which was a relief to Lucy, and left her quite alone. But he was not far off, for presently she heard a troubled movement, and a shouting coming along which filled her with fear. A moment afterwards, and a throng of people came pouring round the corner by the prison wall, in the midst of whom was the wood-sawyer, hand in hand with the vengeance. There could not be fewer than five hundred people, and they were dancing like five thousand demons. There was no other music than their own singing. They danced to the popular revolution song, 
keeping a ferocious time that was like a gnashing of teeth in unison. Men and women danced together, women danced together, men danced together, as Hazard had brought them together. At first they were a mere storm of coarse red caps and coarse woollen rags. But as they filled the place and stopped to dance about Lucy, some ghastly apparition of a dance figure gone raving mad arose among them. They advanced, retreated, struck at one another's hands, clutched at one another's heads, spun round alone, caught one another, and spun round in pairs, until many of them dropped. While those were down, the rest linked hand in hand, and all spun round together. Then the ring broke, and in separate rings of two and four they turned and turned, until they all stopped at once, began again, struck, clutched and tore, and then reversed the spin, and all spun round another way. Suddenly they stopped again, paused, struck out the time afresh, formed into lines the width of the public way, and with their heads low down and their hands high up, swooped, screaming off. No fight could have been half so terrible as this dance. It was so emphatically a fallen sport, a something once innocent delivered over to all devilry, a healthy pastime changed into a means of angering the blood, bewildering the senses, and stealing the heart. Such grace as was visible in it made it the uglier, showing how warped and perverted all things good by nature were become. The maidenly bosom bared to this, the pretty, almost child's head thus distracted, the delicate foot mincing in this slough of blood and dirt, were types of the disjointed time. This was the Carmagnole, as it passed, leaving Lucy frightened and bewildered in the doorway of the wood sawyer's house, the feathery snow fell as quietly and lay as white and as soft as if it had never been. Oh, my father! For he stood before her when she lifted up the eyes she had momentarily darkened with her hand. Such a cruel, bad sight! I know, my dear, I know, I have seen it many times. Don't be frightened. Not one of them would harm you. I am not frightened for myself, my father. But when I think of my husband, and the mercies of these people— We will set him above their mercies very soon. I left him climbing to the window, and I came to tell you. There is no one here to see. You may kiss your hand towards that highest shelving roof— I do so, father, and I send him my soul with it. You cannot see him, my poor dear. No, father, said Lucy, yearning and weeping as she kissed her hand. No. A footstep in the snow. Madame Defarge. I salute you, citizeness, from the doctor. I salute you, citizen. This in passing, nothing more. Madame Defarge gone, like a shadow over the white road. Give me your arm, my love. Pass from here with an air of cheerfulness and courage, for his sake. That was well done. They had left the spot. It shall not be in vain. Charles is summoned for to-morrow. For to-morrow? There is no time to lose. I am well prepared, but there are precautions to be taken— that could not be taken until he was actually summoned before the tribunal. He has not received the notice yet, but I know that he will presently be summoned for to-morrow, and removed to the conciergerie. I have timely information. You're not afraid? She could scarcely answer. I trust in you. Do so, implicitly. Your suspense is nearly ended, my darling. He shall be restored to you within a few hours. I have encompassed him with every protection. I must see Lorry. He stopped. There was a heavy lumbering of wheels within hearing. They both knew too well what it meant. One, two, three. Three tumbrils faring away with their dread loads over the hushing snow. I must see Lorry, the doctor repeated, turning her another way. The staunch old gentleman was still in his trust, had never left it. He and his books were in frequent requisition as to property confiscated and made national. What he could save for the owners, he saved. 
no better man living to hold fast by what Tellson's had in keeping, and to hold his peace. A murky red and yellow sky, and a rising mist from the Seine, denoted the approach of darkness. It was almost dark when they arrived at the bank. The stately residence of Monseigneur was altogether blighted and deserted. Above a heap of dust and ashes in the court ran the letters, National Property, the Republic One and Indivisible, Liberty, Equality, Fraternity, or Death. Who could that be with Mr. Lorry, the owner of the riding-coat upon the chair, who must not be seen? From whom, newly arrived, did he come out, agitated and surprised, to take his favourite in his arms? To whom did he appear to repeat her faltering words, when, raising his voice and turning his head towards the door of the room from which he had issued, he said, Remove to the conciergerie, and summon for to-morrow? Chapter 6. Triumph. The dread tribunal of five judges, public prosecutor and determined jury, sat every day. Their lists went forth every evening, and were read out by the jailers of the various prisons to their prisoners. The standard jailer joke was, "'Come out and listen to the evening paper, you inside there! Charles Evremond Cordane!' So at last began the evening paper at La Force. When a name was called, its owner stepped apart into a spot reserved for those who were announced as being thus fatally recorded. Charles Evremond, called Darnay, had reason to know the usage. He had seen hundreds pass away so. His bloated jailer, who wore spectacles to read with, glanced over them to assure himself that he had taken his place, and went through the list, making a similar short pause at each name. There were twenty-three names, but only twenty were responded to, for one of the prisoners so summoned had died in jail and been forgotten, and two had already been guillotined and forgotten. The list was read, in the vaulted chamber where Darnay had seen the associated prisoners on the night of his arrival. Every one of those had perished in the massacre. Every human creature he had since cared for and parted with had died on the scaffold. There were hurried words of farewell and kindness, but the parting was soon over. It was the incident of every day, and the society of La Force were engaged in the preparation of some games of forfeit and a little concert for that evening. They crowded to the grates and shed tears there, but twenty places in the projected entertainments had to be refilled, and the time was at best short to the lock-up hour, when the common rooms and corridors would be delivered over to the great dogs who kept watch there through the night. The prisoners were far from insensible or unfeeling. Their ways arose out of the condition of the time. Similarly, though with a subtle difference, a species of fervour or intoxication, known, without doubt, to have led some persons to brave the guillotine unnecessarily, and to die by it, was not mere boastfulness, but a wild infection of the wildly shaken public mind. In seasons of pestilence, some of us will have a secret attraction to the disease, a terrible passing inclination to die of it. And all of us have like wonders hidden in our breasts, only needing circumstances to evoke them. The passage to the conciergerie was short and dark. The night in its vermin-haunted cells was long and cold. Next day, fifteen prisoners were put to the bar before Charles Darnay's name was called. All the fifteen were condemned, and the trials of the whole occupied an hour and a half. Charles Evremond, called Darnay, was at length arraigned. His judges sat upon the bench in feathered hats, but the rough red cap and tricoloured cockade was the headdress otherwise prevailing. 
Looking at the jury and the turbulent audience, he might have thought that the usual order of things was reversed, and that the felons were trying the honest men, the lowest, cruelest, and worst populace of a city, never without its quantity of low, cruel, and bad, were the directing spirits of the scene, noisily commenting, applauding, disapproving, anticipating, and precipitating the result without a check. Of the men, the greater part were armed in various ways. Of the women, some wore knives, some daggers, some ate and drank as they looked on, many knitted. Among these last was one, with a spare piece of knitting under her arm as she worked. She was in a front row, by the side of a man whom he had never seen since his arrival at the barrier, but whom he directly remembered as Defarge. He noticed that she once or twice whispered in his ear, and that she seemed to be his wife. But what he most noticed in the two figures was that, although they were posted as close to himself as they could be, they never looked towards him. They seemed to be waiting for something, with a dogged determination, and they looked at the jury, but at nothing else. Under the President sat Dr. Manette in his usual quiet dress. As well as the prisoner could see, he and Mr. Lorry were the only men there unconnected with the tribunal, who wore their usual clothes, and had not assumed the coarse garb of the Carmagnole. Charles Evremond, called Darnay, was accused by the public prosecutor as an emigrant, whose life was forfeit to the Republic, under the decree which banished all emigrants on pain of death. It was nothing that the decree bore date since his return to France. There he was, and there was the decree. He had been taken in France, and his head was demanded. "'Take off his head!' cried the audience. "'An enemy to the Republic!' The President rang his bell to silence those cries, and asked the prisoner whether it was not true that he had lived many years in England. Undoubtedly it was. Was he not an emigrant then? What did he call himself? Not an emigrant, he hoped, within the sense and spirit of the law. Why not, the President desired to know? because he had voluntarily relinquished a title that was distasteful to him, and a station that was distasteful to him, and had left his country. He submitted before the word emigrant in the present acceptation by the tribunal was in use, to live by his own industry in England, rather than on the industry of the overladen people of France. What proof had he of this? He handed in the names of two witnesses, Theophile Gabel and Alexandre Manette. But he had married in England, the President reminded him. True, but not an English woman. A citizeness of France? Yes, by birth. Her name and family? Lucy Manette, only daughter of Dr. Manette, the good physician who sits there. This answer had a happy effect upon the audience. Cries in exaltation of the well-known good physician rent the hall. So capriciously were the people moved that tears immediately rolled down several ferocious countenances which had been glaring at the prisoner a moment before, as if with impatience to pluck him out into the streets and kill him. On these few steps of his dangerous way, Charles Darnay had set his foot, according to Dr. Manette's reiterated instructions. The same cautious counsel directed every step that lay before him, and had prepared every inch of his road. The President asked why had he returned to France when he did, and not sooner. He had not returned sooner, he replied, simply because he had no means of living in France, save those he had resigned, whereas in England he lived by giving instruction in the French language and literature. He had returned when he did on the pressing and written entreaty of a French citizen who represented that his life was endangered by his absence. He had come back to save a citizen's life, and to bear his testimony at whatever personal hazard to the truth. Was that criminal in the eyes of the Republic? 
the populace cried enthusiastically, No! and the president rang his bell to quiet them, which it did not, for they continued to cry, No! until they left off of their own will. The president required the name of that citizen. The accused explained that the citizen was his first witness. He also referred with confidence to the citizen's letter, which had been taken from him at the barrier, but which he did not doubt would be found among the papers then before the president. The doctor had taken care that it should be there, had assured him that it would be there, and at this stage of the proceedings it was produced and read. Citizen Gabel was called to confirm it, and did so. Citizen Gabel hinted, with infinite delicacy and politeness, that in the pressure of business imposed on the tribunal by the multitude of enemies of the Republic with which it had to deal, he had been slightly overlooked in his prison of the Abbe, in fact had rather passed out of the tribunal's patriotic remembrance, until three days ago, when he had been summoned before it, and had been set at liberty on the jurors declaring themselves satisfied that the accusation against him was answered, as to himself, by the surrender of the citizen Evremond, called Darnay. Dr. Manette was next questioned. His high personal popularity and the clearness of his answers made a great impression. But, as he proceeded, as he showed that the accused was his first friend on his release from his long imprisonment, that the accused had remained in England always faithful and devoted to his daughter and himself in their exile, that, so far from being in favour with the aristocrat government there, he had actually been tried for his life by it, as the foe of England and friend of the United States, as he brought these circumstances into view with the greatest discretion and with the straightforward force of truth and earnestness, the jury and the populace became one. At last, when he appealed by name to Monsieur Lorry, an English gentleman then and there present, who, like himself, had been a witness on that English trial and could corroborate his account of it, the jury declared that they had heard enough, and that they were ready with their votes if the President were content to receive them. At every vote the jurymen voted aloud and individually, the populace set up a shout of applause. All the voices were in the prisoner's favour, and the President declared him free. Then began one of those extraordinary scenes with which the populace sometimes gratified their fickleness, or their better impulses towards generosity and mercy, or which they regarded as some set-off against their swollen account of cruel rage. No man can decide now to which of these motives such extraordinary scenes were referable. It is probable to a blending of all the three, with the second predominating. No sooner was the acquittal pronounced than tears were shed as freely as blood at another time, and such fraternal embraces were bestowed upon the prisoner by as many of both sexes as could rush at him that after his long and unwholesome confinement he was in danger of fainting from exhaustion. None the less, because he knew very well that the very same people, carried by another current, would have rushed at him with the very same intensity to rend him to pieces and strew him over the streets. His removal, to make way for other accused persons who were to be tried, rescued him from these caresses for the moment. Five were to be tried together, next, as enemies of the Republic, forasmuch as they had not assisted it by word or deed. So quick was the tribunal to compensate itself and the nation for a chance lost, that these five came down to him before he left the place, condemned to die within twenty-four hours. The first of them told him so, with the customary prison sign of death, a raised finger, and they all added in words, Long live the Republic! The five had had, it is true, no audience to lengthen their proceedings, for when he and Dr. Manette emerged from the gate, there was a great crowd about it, in which there seemed to be every face he had seen in court, except two, for which he looked in vain. 
On his coming out, the concourse made at him anew, weeping, embracing, and shouting, all by turns and all together, until the very tide of the river on the bank of which the mad scene was acted seemed to run mad like the people on the shore. They put him into a great chair they had among them, and which they had taken either out of the court itself or one of its rooms or passages. Over the chair they had thrown a red flag, and to the back of it they had bound a pike with a red cap on its top. In this car of triumph not even the doctor's entreaties could prevent his being carried to his home on men's shoulders, with a confused sea of red caps heaving about him and casting up up to sight from the stormy deep such wrecks of faces that he more than once misdoubted his mind being in confusion, and that he was in the tumbril on his way to the guillotine. In wild, dreamlike procession, embracing whom they met and pointing him out, they carried him on, reddening the snowy streets with the prevailing Republican colour, in winding and tramping through them, as they had reddened them below the snow with a deeper dye. They carried him thus into the courtyard of the building where he lived. Her father had gone on before to prepare her, and when her husband stood upon his feet, she dropped insensible in his arms. As he held her to his heart, and turned her beautiful head between his face and the brawling crowd, so that his tears and her lips might come together unseen, a few of the people fell to dancing. Instantly all the rest fell to dancing, and the courtyard overflowed with a calm and yawl. Then they elevated into the vacant chair a young woman from the crowd, to be carried as the goddess of liberty, and then, swelling and overflowing out into the adjacent streets, and along the river's bank, and over the bridge, the Carmignol absorbed them every one, and whirled them away. After grasping the doctor's hand, as he stood victorious and proud before him, after grasping the hand of Mr. Lorry, who came panting in breathless from his struggle against the water-spout of the Carmignol, after kissing little Lucy, who was lifted up to clasp her arms around his neck, and after embracing the ever-zealous and faithful Pross, who lifted her, he took his wife in his arms and carried her up to their rooms. Lucy, my own, I am safe. Oh, dearest Charles, let me thank God for this on my knees, as I have prayed to him. They all reverently bowed their heads and hearts. When she was again in his arms, he said to her, And now speak to your father, dearest. No other man in all this France could have done what he has done for me. She laid her head upon her father's breast, as she had laid his poor head on her own breast long, long ago. He was happy in the return he had made her. He was recompensed for his suffering. He was proud of his strength. You must not be weak, my darling, he remonstrated. Don't tremble so. I have saved him. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens Book the Third The Track of a Storm Chapter Seven A Knock at the Door I have saved him. It was not another of the dreams in which he had often come back. He was really here, and yet his wife trembled, and a vague but heavy fear was upon her. All the air round was so thick and dark, the people were so passionately revengeful and fitful, the innocent were so constantly put to death on vague suspicion and black malice, it was so impossible to forget that many as blameless as her husband, and as dear to others as he was to her, every day shared the fate from which she had been clutched, that her heart could not be as lightened of its load as she felt it ought to be. The shadows of the wintry afternoon were beginning to fall and even now the dreadful carts were rolling through the streets. Her mind pursued them, looking for him among the condemned, and then she clung closer to his real presence and trembled more. Her father, cheering her, showed a compassionate superiority to this woman's weakness, which was wonderful to see. No garret, no shoemaking, no one hundred and five North Tower now. He had accomplished the task he had set himself. His promise was redeemed. 
He had saved Charles. Let them all lean upon him. Their housekeeping was of a very frugal kind, not only because that was the safest way of life, involving the least offence to the people, but because they were not rich, and Charles, throughout his imprisonment, had had to pay heavily for his bad food, and for his guard, and towards the living of the poorer prisoners. Partly on this account, and partly to avoid a domestic spy, they kept no servant. The citizen and citizeness who acted as porters at the courtyard gate rendered them occasional service, and Jerry, almost wholly transferred to them by Mr. Lorry, had become their daily retainer, and had his bed there every night. It was an ordinance of the Republic, one and indivisible, of liberty, equality, fraternity, or death, that on the door or doorpost of every house the name of every inmate must be legibly inscribed in letters of a certain size at a certain convenient height from the ground. Mr. Jerry Cruncher's name, therefore, duly embellished the doorpost down below. And, as the afternoon shadows deepened, the owner of that name himself appeared, from overlooking a painter whom Dr. Manette had employed to add to the list the name of Charles Evermond called Darnay. In the universal fear and distrust that darkened the time, all the usual harmless ways of life were changed. In the doctor's little household, as in very many others, the articles of daily consumption that were wanted were purchased every evening, in small quantities, and at various small shops. To avoid attracting notice, and to give as little occasion as possible for talk and envy, was the general desire. For some months past, Miss Pross and Mr. Cruncher had discharged the office of purveyors, the former carrying the money, the latter the basket. Every afternoon, at about the time when the public lamps were lighted, they fared forth on this duty, and made and brought home such purchases as were needful. Although Miss Pross, through her long association with the French family, might have known as much of their language as of her own, if she had had a mind, she had no mind in that direction. Consequently, she knew no more of that nonsense, as she was pleased to call it, than Mr. Cruncher did. So her manner of marketing was to plump a noun substantive at the head of the shopkeeper, without any introduction in the nature of an article, and, if it happened not to be the name of the thing she wanted, to look round for that thing, lay hold of it, and hold on by it until the bargain was concluded. She always made a bargain for it, by holding up, as a statement of its just price, one finger less than the merchant held up, whatever his number might be. "'Now, Mr. Cruncher,' said Miss Pross, whose eyes were red with felicity, "'if you are ready, I am.' Jerry hoarsely professed himself at Miss Pross's service. He had worn all his rust off long ago, but nothing would file his spiky head down. "'There's all manner of things wanted,' said Miss Pross, "'and we shall have a precious time of it. We want wine among the rest.' Nice toast these redheads will be drinking, wherever we buy it. "'It will be much the same to your knowledge, miss, I should think,' retorted Jerry, "'whether they drink your health or the old uns.' "'Who's he?' said Miss Pross. Mr. Cruncher, with some diffidence, explained himself as meaning old Nicks. "'Ha! It doesn't need an interpreter to explain the meaning of these creatures. They have but one, and it's midnight murder and mischief.' "'Hush, dear, pray, pray be cautious,' cried Lucy. "'Yes, yes, yes, I'll be cautious. "'But I may say among ourselves that I do hope there will be no oniony and tobacco-y smotherings in the form of embracings all around, going on in the streets. "'Now, Ladybird, never you stir from that fire till I come back. "'Take care of the dear husband you have recovered, "'and don't move your pretty head from his shoulder as you have it now, till you see me again. "'May I ask you a question, Dr. Manette, before I go?' "'I think you may take that liberty,' the doctor answered, smiling. "'For gracious sake, don't talk about liberty. We have quite enough of that,' said Miss Pross. "'Hush, dear, again,' Lucy remonstrated. "'Well, my sweet,' said Miss Pross, nodding her head emphatically, "'the short and the long of it is that I am a subject of His Most Gracious Majesty King George the Third. Miss Pross curtsied at the name. And as such, my maxim is, confound their politics, frustrate their knavish tricks, on him our hopes we fix, God save the king. Mr. Cruncher, in an access of loyalty, growlingly repeated the words after Miss Pross, like somebody at church. I am glad you have so much of the Englishman in you, though I wish you had never taken that cold in your voice, said Miss Pross approvingly. But the question, Dr. Manette, is there— 
It was the good creature's way to affect to make light of anything that was a great anxiety with them all, and to come at it in this chance manner. Is there any prospect yet of our getting out of this place? I fear not yet. It would be dangerous for Charles yet. Hey ho hum, said Miss Pross, cheerfully repressing a sigh as she glanced at her darling's golden hair in the light of the fire. Then we must have patience and wait, that's all. We must hold up our heads and fight low, as my brother Solomon used to say. Now, Mr. Cruncher, don't you move, Ladybird. They went out, leaving Lucy and her husband, her father, and the child by a bright fire. Mr. Lorry was expected back presently from the banking-house. Miss Pross had lighted the lamp, but had put it aside in a corner that they might enjoy the firelight undisturbed. Little Lucy sat by her grandfather with her hands clasped through his arm, and he, in a tone not rising much above a whisper, began to tell her a story of a great and powerful fairy who had opened a prison wall and let out a captive who had once done the fairy a service. All was subdued and quiet, and Lucy was more at ease than she had been. "'What is that?' she cried all at once. "'My dear,' said her father, stopping in his story and laying his hand on hers, "'command yourself. What a disordered state you are in! The least thing, nothing, startles you. You, your father's daughter.' "'I thought my father,' said Lucy, excusing herself, with a pale face and in a faltering voice, "'that I heard strange feet upon the stair.' "'My love, the staircase is as still as death.' As he said the word, a blow was struck upon the door. "'Oh, father, father, what can this be? Hide, Charles, save him!' "'My child,' said the doctor, rising, and laying his hand upon her shoulder, "'I have saved him. What weakness is this, my dear? Let me go to the door.' He took the lamp in his hand, crossed the two intervening outer rooms, and opened it. A rude clattering of feet over the floor, and four rough men in red caps, armed with sabres and pistols, entered the room. "'The citizen Evremond called Darnay,' said the first. "'Who seeks him?' answered Darnay. "'I seek him. We seek him. I know you, Evremond. I saw you before the tribunal to-day. You are again the prisoner of the Republic.' The four surrounded him, where he stood with his wife and child clinging to him. Tell me how and why am I again a prisoner? It is enough that you return straight to the conciergerie and will know to-morrow. You are summoned for to-morrow. Dr. Manette, whom this visitation had so turned into stone, that he stood with the lamp in his hand, as if be woe a statue made to hold it, moved after these words were spoken, put the lamp down, and confronting the speaker and taking him, not ungently, by the loose front of his red woolen shirt, said, you know him, you have said. Do you know me? Yes, I know you, citizen doctor. We all know you, citizen doctor, said the other three. He looked abstractedly from one to the other, and said in a lower voice after a pause, Will you answer his question to me, then? How does this happen? Citizen doctor, said the first reluctantly, he has been denounced to the section of St. Antoine. This citizen, pointing out the second who had entered, is from St. Antoine. The citizen here indicated, nodded his head, and added, He is accused by St. Antoine. Of what? asked the doctor. Citizen doctor, said the first, with his former reluctance, ask no more. If the Republic demands sacrifices from you, without doubt you, as good patriot, will be happy to make them. The Republic goes before all. The people is supreme. Evermond, we are pressed. One word the doctor entreated. Will you tell me who denounced him? It is against rule, answered the first, but you can ask him of St. Antoine here. The doctor turned his eyes upon that man, who moved uneasily on his feet, rubbed his beard a little, and at length said, Well, truly it is against rule, but he is denounced, and gravely, by the citizen and citizeness de Farge, and by one other. What other? Do you ask, citizen doctor? Yes. Then, said he of St. Antoine, with a strange look, you will be answered to-morrow. Now I am dumb. End of chapter 7 A Knock at the Door 
Book the Third, The Track of a Storm.